Good afternoon. My name is Riley Foreman and I'm a first year MBA student at MIT Sloan. It's my pleasure to introduce our panel, Fact or Fiction, Basketball Myth Busting. Today, our panel of myth busters include Elton Brand, Philadelphia 76ers general manager, Sonia Rahman, Grizzlies assistant coach and former MIT head women's basketball coach, and Mike Sarin, Celtics vice president of basketball ops and team council. Our panel will be moderated by ESPN moderator, author, and professor, Kurt Goldsberry. The panel will run for 35 minutes and we will leave 10 minutes at the end for questions. Please use the chat on the right side of the window for discussions during the panel and submit questions for our panelists on Twitter using the hashtag basketball mythbusters. Questions will then be selected by the moderator. And with that, I'll turn it over to Kurt. Thank you, Riley. And uh, before we begin on behalf of the whole panel, I just wanna, I wanna thank the student organizers uh, for all their hard work, especially this year. This is my 10th Sloan Conference. I know Mike has had even more than that, but this has certainly been one of the most difficult and unique ones to put on. So thank you to all the students, the faculty, and of course, Jess Gelman and Daryl Morey for having us uh, despite these crazy uh, circumstances. So well done to everybody. We're happy to be here. We're happy to have a fun discussion about fact or fiction. And without further ado, let's jump right in. Uh, anybody can take this one, fact or fiction. I'm gonna get, I'm gonna look at you, Mike. The NBA currently has an emerging talent distribution crisis. These super teams are consolidating all the best players into a few select cities. Fact or fiction? Um, I think it's it's no more uh, fact than it has been for a very very long time. So I'll say fiction. Um, I got I think I got the same question in 2008. Um, <laughs> And, you know, the, the Lakers got this question in 2001 and the Celtics and Lakers got this question in the 80s. And um, I think, I think um, you know, the best teams are going to have a collection of good players. The thing that may have changed is there's a little bit more focus maybe on, on players sort of choosing to go somewhere together. Um, but even that, you know, has been an issue since uh, the decision, right? So um, I, I don't think I see something different going on now. There are a bunch of teams in bigger markets who are bad for a long time and they happen to, you know, the way the system's set up, they get good. You sort of go up and down some. And, and so those teams are getting good at the same time, but I, I don't think it's any different than it has been. That is, I, I guess that means fiction. Fiction. Um, I'll toss it to Elton in a second, but here, I think you were really smart to pinpoint the decision because between 1969 and 2010, uh, 41 of the uh, only seven of 41 finals MVPs had won that award after switching teams since 2010, eight of those 10 finals MVP winners have done that. Uh, so I think it's true that something's happening. Maybe it's not super teams, but I, I think you nailed it. You pointed to 2010 and the decision and players choosing where they're winning these games uh, might be a big concept. Elton, what do you think? Um, yeah, I'd agree. I'd agree with you, Mike. I think it's, uh, you know, kind of the player empowerment movement. The players are vocal about it. They're saying, I want to go to this team. I do not want to go to this team or this market. And I think that's what, what the change is, you know, what that's what we're seeing, you know, through the media, through hearing about, you know, player X wanting to be with, with his teammate or his friend. Um, in the past, it would be up to us, management or you know, coaches or ownership to figure out a way to get these elite players. Now it's it's more of the um, feel that they're doing on their own, which they're not, as we know. But that's the feel. I think I think that's what it seems like. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I mean, there's a part of me that thinks it, it will be interesting to see. You know, Sonia, your team, you've got a couple of really good young stars if they continue on their upward trajectory and somehow you guys are able to make cap space. My bet is a third star would be willing to join them to win there, uh, despite the fact that Memphis isn't considered like a premier market or anything like that. I still think it's about where you can go to, to win um, more than the, the specific city. I think guys are choosing places where they, you know, the, the Nets had room to sign all those guys. Um and, uh, and, you know, if it, if it had been somewhere else where it had worked out that way, I think, you know, you would see guys going other places too, but I might be wrong about that. You know, it's, I, I don't think we, this isn't some enormous market of information, right? There's only 30 teams, only a few of them have cap space each year and guys come up at certain times. So 
Um, I, and it's got to be longer than since the decisions for me to feel confident in it. I, I'd want to follow up on that quickly too. I agree. You know, if a team has cast space, a team has young talent, and they become friends because the talent you meet at all star games, you're at award shows, you become friends. Now we can win a championship together and be compensated for it. You know, you can live wherever you want to live in the off season. Like, so I, I agree. I think, uh, you know, a team like Philadelphia will continue to. No. <laughs> <laughs> Coach, do you have any thoughts on this? You are, are sort of, uh, you represent a smaller market than our, our other panelists, one from Philadelphia, one from Boston. Uh, Mike alluded to Memphis's status as sort of a less than prominent uh, NBA market. I know it's your first year on the bench, but. Do you have any thoughts there? Do you feel that the players are, are more likely, especially the big, the best players in the league, to migrate to certain markets over places like Memphis? Well, I'd like to agree with Mike um, that, you know, and Elton, that it doesn't really matter where you are. I think that, um, you know, friendships are formed. Um, talents might, you know, be blended together in a certain way where, where you know, guys realize that it, it might be beneficial, mutually beneficial to play together. But in terms of where, um, you know, like Elton said, you can live wherever you want in the off season. Um, I think we're well past the old, you know, the days of old, like media markets being important. I mean, you can be anywhere and, and have a platform and, and with social media and, and the marketing that we have. So you don't have to be in, you know, the, the bigger cities to, um, to, you know, for your games to be on TV, you know, the, the, the viewership is going to go where the talent is. Um, so I'd like to think that it can happen in, in any market. Counterpoint. They don't shoot Space Jam in Memphis, Coach. So, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> uh, good stuff. Elton, I wanted, I wanted to direct one question for you. Not yet. Fair question. Fair, fair point. Uh, Elton, uh, your basketball journey has taken you from one of the best high school players in the state of New York, Mr. Basketball, National College Player of the Year at Duke, number one pick in the draft, and obviously a, a great career in the NBA as a player, uh, and now one of the executives at, at one of the best teams in the Eastern Conference. Um, you've seen the NBA and basketball at large change so much throughout um, this remarkable career and journey through basketball. My question for you is, how is your relationship with analytics, since we're at the Sloan Conference, how has your relationship with analytics sort of evolved uh, throughout this remarkable journey you've had? Uh, that's a great question. So, you know, just growing up, Peaks go to New York, it was just about putting the ball in the hoop, being the best player I could be, you know, working hard. Um, you go to New York City, you play with players like Ron Artest, Lamar Odom, and AAU, and travel across the country. Um, again, it's all about focusing on how can I be the best player I can be. You know, it's all about finding an advantage. Um, then you get to the collegiate level. Coach K, we were watching it on, like, uh, the old school, you know, video, like, on the movie screen. <laughs> But we watched film and we got better. You know, once I got to the NBA, um, you know, data really became more important. You know, you were trying management, trying to find any way they can to enhance their players to get better. Whether it's, you know, I started with the Bulls and it was the Birdo Center. They had one of the, the earliest, you know, best practice facilities with massage and food and, um, you know, early versions of of shot tracking even, like it was, it was amazing, you know, but that was after six championships. Um, you know, now in the, as an exec, you know, we try to have a relationship with the players that they understand that it's, it's, it's for their best interest to, you know, learn about the data, learn about what we're trying to do with analytics so that they can make more money, they can win more, they can be more successful and we can be more successful. So I think there was a trust issue that happened you know once once it started really moving to a certain level the players didn't trust it oh they're just tracking us oh they just want to you know they just want us to play a certain way or oh they don't know the game but now i, I see that slowly breaking down because a lot of our players they want to know how can they be most effective what shots can i take to to you know have a longer career to help our team be successful so it, it's changed over the you know 30 years i've been involved with the sport Great. Uh, and Coach Rahman, sim similar question to you. Um, you've come from coaching women's basketball at some of the best universities uh, in the country, specifically MIT. Uh, and now I I'm just curious of, of, of how you've seen sort of the analytic culture 
around the sport change as you've gone uh, mm -hmm. from women's college basketball to now coaching in the NBA? Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting, you know, coaching at MIT, you would think, you know, automatically analytics are there. Um, all the players are bought in immediately and, you know, data driven. Um, but, you know, they're, they're basketball players and they're, they've been coached a certain way, you know, all through high school and AAU. So analytics, when it came to basketball, was, was new for them, too. So similar to, I think, what Elton alluded to, that um, you need to educate um, on, you know, on the analytics, on the numbers, how it can be effective, how it can be utilized. Um, the communication and also just that collaboration. Like I tried to really um, explain what the numbers were, show, show them film. Um, you know, analytics never gives you a cut and dry answer. It might make you lean one way or another, but then collaborate, you know, like what, how, what do you guys feel comfortable with with the coverage? Here's what the numbers are saying. This is why we think the numbers are playing out that way. Here's our eye test. Um, but let's have a conversation about it. And, you know, we, we would get to that point with our players where there's just like such a high level of trust that we're involving them with some of those decisions too. So, you know, that was my experience at MIT. Um, they ended up being really good students of the game and, and certainly embraced the analytics and um, watching it evolve um, at the college level, it's been a little bit slower. So, you know, jumping over to the NBA, like that was just a huge leap um, in my world of analytics. I mean, there's data on everything. So... Um, it's it, there and the challenge is really like what matters most, you know, like what's really important and, and not just what's noisy data or what's recent data, but um, what really matters. But it's, it's, I think, you know, we've said it like it, it only helps in the end if you find, um, if you can get the buy-in. Great. And uh, I want to use your experience to sort of pivot to our next topic. And uh, speaking of data on everything, you know, the first year the three-point line existed in 1979, 3% of NBA shots were threes. Uh, this season, I believe it's very close to 40%. Uh, and if present trends continue, realistically, over half of NBA shots uh, could be three-point shots by the end of this decade. Um, and I, I want to talk about that specifically in the context of something Coach Rahman has coached through uh, at MIT, which was the the women's college basketball uh, league, the NCAA moved their three point line. So has virtually every other major basketball league um, on the planet over the last decade or so. The only one that hasn't is our league. The NBA uh, remains sort of consistent with its three point line placement, with a three year exception in the 1990s. Mike. Is it time to at least consider, wait, let me, let me use the factor fiction line. Factor fiction. It's time to consider moving the three point line in the NBA. Uh, not high on my list of changes to make to the NBA right now. Uh, fiction, But uh, the main reason is um, I, I, I think at the end of the day, we're an entertainment product. And I would want to hear from fans that they suddenly are not liking the game as much. And instead, what we're hearing is fans like the game more than ever. There are more people interacting with the NBA now than there ever were before in all sorts of ways, regardless of what the ups and downs of individual game, full game TV ratings. Um, and so you got to listen to the customer some, and people love the NBA right now. The floor is really spread. There's more exciting plays at the hoop as a result, and there are also more crazy long distance shots. If you look at the, you know, which, which top shot moments sell for a lot, there's a bunch of really long distance shots for you guys that people want. So um, I, I think, you know, you also have this problem that, that the other leagues didn't have because of where their three point line was. We have the corners. And so the further out you move the rest of that three point line, the bigger the disparity between a corner three and the other threes. And we're not going to make the court wider because then there's less seats. And so we sell fewer tickets. Um, so I don't, I don't really know what that would accomplish uh, other than, you know, maybe lower scoring games and, and more, maybe we get back to more mid range or post play some, but I'm not sure that people desire that. There are a bunch of traditionalists telling me forever that, you know, there's too many threes. And, and I heard that 10 years ago and now there's way more threes and we're still hearing it from the same people, but it doesn't seem like there's more people saying until more people are saying that, I think that's fiction. Okay, I like it. We're going to throw it to Elton, but I, I want to segue to it because uh, 
there is internal data at the NBA. They've, they've pulled the fans. And one thing they do like is the diversity of scoring in the league. That is something they have recently started to express is the two shot type. Hey, it's Daryl's house here. I'll be careful how I say it. The two shots. Daryl's got two. Joel Embiid. <laughs> yeah, now I know. Now Joel is shooting 60% from mid range and he loves mid range. But hey, speaking of mid range, Elton, you are one of the best mid range shooters of your era. Um, is it just speaking as a fan, as a mentor, uh, as somebody who played a long time in the NBA, is it a little bit jarring? Forget analytics for a second. Is it a little bit jarring to see those shot types that you really uh, made a, a lot of money and won a lot of games with sort of <laughs> departing the NBA? It's only jarring because that was my staple. And it's like, I was known for that face up mid range jumpers and it's, but the reason I did it was to be more effective. Like at six, seven and a half, I was undersized. And that's when Shaq, every team had two seven foot plus guys to guard Shaq. So I'm guard, I'm, it's, you know, and then it's, the power forwards were six, 11 bruisers, you know, PJ Browns. And, you know, these, these guys were, you know, strong and big and long. So that's, that's the way I felt I can be effective and score. So, you know, as much as it hurts, for one of my staples to be taken out of the game, I, I think it's I think it's the right it's the right play and the efficiency. You know, we're becoming more efficient. The last six years, it's we're increasing our three point efficiency every year as a league. You know, it's going up even from last year, from you know thirty six point seven to you know I mean it's thirty six point seven this year from thirty five point five. So we're not out there just hoisting brick and threes. Now that I don't think fans would love that, but I like to see all star games. Um, players shooting from half court like that's amazing to me you know as a as a fan of the game like that is that's a special moment so you know as much as it hurts me because I, I made I made my living off it literally um I think it's the right play Ellen did anyone ever tell you you should move back like how did you react to that? <laughs> so coach Igor um he coached the Suns and you know yeah he, he coached with the Clippers he told me that he was from you know Europe he said you're strong enough um, you should shoot threes from the top of the key. And we were shooting them. And then I just thought about all the tough lumbering bigs that said, you're soft if you shoot jumpers. Yeah. So it was a mind trick. They tricked me. I would have moved back. I would have been, I would have moved back. You know? guys was with KG and he was like, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> Same reason. Same reason. Like you're soft. You're soft if you shoot jumpers. But then, you know, Rasheed Wallace wasn't soft. Dirk Nowitzki wasn't soft. And I, you know. Guys started winning and winning championships with, with that with those plays. So, um, yeah, I wish I would have just been soft. <laughs> yeah, you could have been soft and rich. And I don't think uh, Kevin Garnett would have said hell no. I think his words would might might have been more colorful, but uh, we uh, won't say that here at the Swan. You don't do that here. It's it, it was longer. There's no doubt. <laughs> Coach uh, Raman, this one's for you. Uh, you know, women's college basketball. I'm going to ask you to put your your coach hat on from 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 your women's days. It is having a moment. I mean, the women's tournament was really great uh, this year. Their gameplay is a little bit more diverse in terms of shot selection in women's college basketball. Uh, but, you know, there was also a really interesting – and remember, this is the Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. We're supposed to be talking about basketball, not just NBAs. So I have to ask you about that one moment that happened during the tournament when a women's player shared on social media the state of their weight room. Uh, versus their male counterparts and how shocked and outraged many of us were to see that. Uh, as somebody who spent decades around women's college basketball, I'd love to know what you thought about that moment and that controversy. Sure. Um, well, first of all, I think it just highlights, um, you saw it in the bubble with the WNBA last year. Um, women are out there, you know, being, being activists, being vocal, um, not accepting things that aren't going to be fair or equal. So you know, good for Sedona Prince, um, Morgan, and, and the spring coach at Stanford for bringing this to light. Um, I don't think that people, you know, coming from the women's basketball world were very surprised by that. Um, I think the Division One tournament, the Division One tournament on the men's side versus the women's side, um, it's clearly been operated um, differently. There's two different committees that run it. Um, and, um, you know, just it feels a little bit more like a business. Um, I think what's frustrating is it's the NBAA. This is an amateur organization promoting amateurism. 
at higher ed institutions. Um, it's, it's not supposed to be a business, but it's basically being operated as one. And we can get into a whole different discussion on amateurism and name image likeness and all that. I'm sure there's a panel just for that. Um, but you know, for me at the division three level, um, it, it wasn't a business and it wasn't like that. So um, our men's team made the tournament for a number of years before we got there. And I would, you know, I would go and, and try to learn what I could. And then once we started making it, um, the experience was the same. And I think at the end, it, you know, at the NCAA level, the student athlete experience, there needs to be parity in that experience, even if they're not going to be exactly the same. You know, there's more fans, two to three times more fans that, you know, buy tickets for the men's tournament. The operating costs are going to be different. A lot is going to be different. Um, but I think the student athlete experience really needs to be the same um, in whatever way it can happen. Great. Um... Elton, Mike, any any responses, or did you guys have any sort of uh, reactions to that saga as it unfolded a few weeks ago? The timing was totally fascinating with the Supreme Court considering the Austin <laughs> case at the same same time, because mm -hmm. uh, it just sort of highlights the, the mess that is the concept of amateurism. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I didn't. I mean, I I actually reacted more strongly to the fact that. Uh, and maybe this is just because my job has been so messed up this year and, and you guys will both appreciate this who are working for the league, but they were doing PCR tests for the men's tournament and antigen tests for the women's tournament. So not just like, you know, I mean, you could say what you want about the amount of work you'll do in a weight room over the course of the tournament, but like people's health was treated differently in a way that I, I just couldn't fathom that they had allowed to happen. Um, but like the NCAA is really messed up for a lot of reasons. Um, I don't really have any connection to it. So I, I'm not sure if I should say that or not, but um, if you listen to the Supreme Court argument and I'm sure you can go listen to it archived somewhere, you, you'll see how doubtful the justices were about the thought that the NCAA can define its product by how much they pay people and then use that definition to say, we can only preserve our product um, if this element of it is kept. Uh, it's very, very strange. I mean, Elton probably has something to say about this as a, as a former college athlete, but uh, it's just totally odd to me. I don't think people are choosing to go to Duke games or not based on how much the players are receiving in benefits. It's because they, they like Duke and they're excited about good basketball players is my guess. Um, but that was the NCAA's argument. I, I, I don't think it's a very compelling one under any antitrust law I know or any moral law. Yeah, I'll speak more to the moral side. Um, you know, one argument, because it, it was ironic, the timing, um, you know, with the Supreme case, uh, Court case being brought about around the same time. And one argument was, well, the men, they make so much more money. And I'm just like, it doesn't matter. These are amateurs. You're supposed to be able to compete at an even level for the tournament. And we, we stayed glued, you know, to, to the women's tournament. You know, my daughter, she's eight years old. She's a, a tremendous fan. And you know, just having that disparity, like I, I just, like I, I felt sick about it. Like just, I don't know if she'll ever hoop at that sort of level, division one level, but still, I'm just like, like this, this cannot be right. So it was, it was highly disappointing. And you know, there's going to be some reform. There's going to be some change with the NCAA. Um, you know, I, I played, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago. <laughs> and, you know, as an athlete, you go there, you, you go, um, you know, you're on a scholarship and you know, back then they were saying that's enough. But I've seen Duke jerseys with the number 42 on the back without my name, but they were sold, some with my name. You know, and it's just like, I didn't even get an education. I dropped out, so no. <laughs> Would you call that a brand name jersey or an off-brand jersey? Uh, off, off-brand. <laughs> off-brand. No, hey, we, that was a dad joke, you know. Yeah, I guess I'm, a, I'm a dad, I get it. Yeah, we can go there. Um, let's have some fun. Elton, you, you guys are, are playing really well this year. Fact or fiction, Joel Embiid is the MVP of the NBA this season. Uh, you know, fact, like you said, let's have some fun. You saw the way he dominated Mike and the Celtics the other day for that 35. <laughs> like, he's, he's been unstoppable. 60% from mid-range, as you jokingly said. You know, 50% um, from the field, plus 40% from three. Um, and the sneaky secret to some, not this group, you know, this is a, a highly, you know, versed crowd, his defense, you know, we're not number one on half court defense, you know, you know, only because of Ben and his great defense, it's Joel protecting the rim. So if you're going to have twos and threes, 
um, rim shots, having Joel down there, you know, playing the way he's played. Um, you know, he's just determined. Daryl did a great job getting him some more spacing. But um, the only thing I think can hold him back is they say he didn't play enough games, but we still have over five weeks left. Uh, we're going to monitor it. We're not going to push him. Um, but, like, if he plays, you know, most of those games, he's hands down MVP to me because, you know, it's likely we'll end up one or two in the East. Um, and that's where the MVPs have been since, I guess, Westbrook, you know, when he, he was in six, but he averaged a triple-double. He had an insane year. So, I, I, I hands down, Joel Embiid is just the most dominant player, um, and he's the MVP this year. Uh, yeah, you, you're, your new friend, Daryl Morey, <laughs> Uh, Russell Westbrook should have that MVP, as I recall. He thought it should have gone to James Harden that year. Um, but triple doubles are a very loud stat in our discourse, fair or not. And and Russell der- certainly broke some records with those triple doubles. Mike, let's have some fun. Is Joel Embiid of the rival Sixers? Is he the MVP of this season? Uh, I'll I'll go. If you're asking me to vote right now, I'll go fiction. <laughs> I want to say it's Jokic, but. But, uh, but Joel is having a hell of a season. There's no doubt. And I, I think uh, one of the interesting things with, with this conversation, whether it's Jokic or Embiid, we're on pace. And I'll toss this to Sonia, but we're on pace to have potentially our first center win the MVP award since Shaquille O'Neal in 2000, 2001. So it's been two year, 20 years and, and centers, uh, bigs have, have sort of fallen out of, superstar relevance for a little bit we've we've been taken over by lebron's and steph curry's and the splash brothers so it's kind of nice to see two big centers at the top of the mvp uh race sonia have you noticed that it, it all in the nba uh that that centers are sort of treated almost like props these days uh compared to potentially other eras or in other leagues do you think the bigs are as relevant as ever in the NBA or, or, or Embiid, Jokic sort of, um, what would you say, uh, exceptions to the rule? Are, are centers sort of still relevant in today's NBA? Yeah, I mean, I think they are. I mean, this conversation certainly proves it. Um, the skill set of bigs um, in the modern NBA is it just it's incredible. Um, you know, what, what bigs do in the NBA, um, you know, growing up, Mike, you know, in your backyard is a Celtics fan and, you know, the centers of the Celtics and, and what we see now. Um, and, you know, I, I enjoy it very much because, you know, in the women's game, the, the center is still a really, really relevant position. I mean, Asia Wilson was just, um, you know, MVP on the WNBA side. And um, you see that, um, you know, much more common, but, you know, it's, it's fun to see. It's fun to see the, the big guys, the big fellows get after it and, and get some love um, with these conversations. I would add two other things. One is um, I think this might be the first year in the last 10 or 11 years that I don't think it's LeBron. Um, so, so uh, you know, that's a big share. That, that's sort of a refreshing change. And then also this goes back to your earlier question. We're talking about, you know, both those guys can shoot, um, but, you know, and, and, and obviously Jokic shoots a few more threes than Joel does, but um they do a lot of post play too. So to the extent that you're really worried about this three point shooting thing, we're talking about the, the top two MVP, you know, contenders, although I'm sure there's some people in the chat who want different people besides those two. Um, uh, you know, we're talking about guys who aren't solely focused on three point shooting. So that, that should lend support to our earlier discussion. Yeah. And I think uh, calling it small ball might be a bit of a misnomer. One of the big trends in the NBA is, is what we might call skill ball. Like, and both of these guys are extremely skilled relative to centers from the eighties and the nineties in terms of their shots. Jokic is one of the best passing big men the planet has ever seen. So it'll be interesting to see the stretch run. I do think to Elton's point, one of the reasons Jokic still looks maybe better is our stats are still very biased towards one end of the court. And we don't really have a fluency uh, to, to demonstrate the impact of a player like Joel Embiid, or even Mike, to get you on my side, Kevin Garnett in his prime uh, when he was anchoring down those incredible defenses for, for your team. So uh, factor fiction, Mike Zarin. 
the new NBA lottery system is working awesome. <laughs> Such a softball question. I know. Well, I got to get you going. I got to get you going. No, I feel about the lottery system. Um, it's better that there's that there's now uh, flattened odds between the worst teams, so you no longer have an incentive, if you are bad, to get historically ludicrously bad. Um, but uh, and, and incentives are like, a, it's a weird term. I, I use that in an economist's way. Um, I, I've always said um, it's bad for our product if our fans perceive that their team should lose. Uh, and so it's really more about that than anything else. Um, it also is just very uncomfortable on a team where your players wonder if that's what you should be doing. Um, and so uh, I don't, you know, not everybody's championship driven. I've, I've talked about this just ad nauseum over the years. People know that I think you should in some way take turns at having high picks. Um, but, um, you know, it's definitely better than it was uh, flattening it out. And, you know, the reason we have a lottery um, is we do actually want to help um, the worst teams. There's, there's some, you know, there's some sort of very legitimate sets of arguments that we don't want a team to have to wait four or five years if some set of unlucky things happen to them um, to get a top young player. Uh, and so that's, that's the reason we've stuck with this system and it, and it makes some sense, but it leads to all sorts of um, unfortunate things, uh, I would say. And, and, you know, the commissioner at this conference has talked about it a few times that, that there's an interesting balancing that goes on at the league level trying to figure it out. But I don't, I don't love the lottery system just because of the, you know, perverse incentives you have to build better or worse teams in different situations. We should be trying to build the best teams all the time. Yeah. But and short I think, term and long term. Obviously, I think everybody's long term maximizing now. Well, let's do one more on that, Mike, because I know you have a really sort of interesting idea that that encompasses a lot of this stuff from incentivizing and, and challenging teams to use team building resources uh, in different ways and maybe a more creative way than the current approach. Can you share that with us? Well, I don't, I mean, we need to spend too much time on it. Daryl actually brought this up on a podcast recently. Um, we, our, our, our staff, David Sparks and Drew Cannon came up with this idea a few years ago that the, the cap system is already a little bit like a strategy game. So let's just make it, let's just go all the way on that and decide that you get a certain number of ping pong balls each year and you can choose to throw them into the lottery or use them for cap exceptions or use them for any number of things. And um, we talked to some people at the league about it. And at the time we had, this is like 2011 or 12, we, we branded it the draft balls, which was a just terrible, terrible branding job by our people. Now we got some really is terrible. Us. None of us are good marketers. And so um, I, I showed it to Darrell at the time. He, he's, he's done some stuff with it since then. Now I think he's calling it Chamberlain coins which like fits the current sort of crypto thing that's going on. And also, you know, there's some chamber numbers associated with Chamberlain. I don't know. Anyway, um, uh, the thought would be that, you know, any resource you want to use in your front office, you could choose to put it all in the draft one year. You could not be in the draft some year and throw it in another year. Um, and then there would still be a lottery just using those ping pong balls and, and you would use them also for that currency uh, for cap exceptions and things. And, you know, we've, we've got some more detail on it, but, it's a pretty drastic change. The league is doing really well right now. I think the appetite for something like that's not super big right now, but we're always trying to think of ways to make, make the world more interesting and better. Um, one of the issues right now, right, is that you, you sort of trading wins for lottery balls, and that's just a weird thing. So in this way, you would be trading, you know, free agent activity potentially for it instead and, and not affect the, the game outcomes or the team building exercise the same way. Yeah, I think that's why it's really interesting, Mike, is, uh, and we're going to get to audience questions here in a second, but I think if it's true that some markets are sort of preordained to be big time destination free agent markets going forward, and some are not, this kind of system could allow a team like Orlando or San Antonio or Oklahoma City to be like, well, we're not getting those free agents. We're putting all of these resources into uh, drafts or exceptions or whatever it is to to stay out of like elite level free agency, because that, let's be honest, we have to overpay average players to get them to come here in this world. So let's be more interested in the draft. I think that's a fascinating idea. I'd love to hear it uh, fleshed out more, but for now, I want to turn it over to uh, fan questions and coach Raman, I'm going to put you on the spot. 
fact or fiction, with a league average free throw percentage of 77%, players who are stronger at getting to the line should be valued higher, a la Billy Bean's infamous, he gets on, on base. Uh, so do you think that the ability to get to the free throw line is an undervalued skill in, in today's NBA or any of other basketball league? Um, I'm not sure if it's undervalued. I mean, I think that when I think of our scouting reports, it's certainly, um, you know, first and foremost, right on there. If someone is really good at getting to the line, um, I can't really speak to the, you know, the free agent and, 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 and that type of conversation. I haven't really been a part of it. Um, but, you know, in, in general, I, I do think that the people who can get to the line, we all know that's a really um, important stat when it comes to the whole analytics package of um, a team profile. Um, so I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say it's undervalued. No, okay. not, in my, not in my limited experience. Elton, I want to ask you, there, there is a growing concern among some uh, that there are some players who are really good at getting to the free throw line and maybe, uh, <laughs> maybe doing certain things uh, to get to the free throw line. They're more interested in getting to the nail than they are to the rim. Um, is there, is that a concern for you? Um, and, and as a player, you mentioned it being soft to shoot threes earlier. That was fascinating. Is there a similar concept among players that guys who go chasing whistles are soft or dirty? And does that dissuade some of our best players from doing that? Uh, what are your thoughts there? You know, I think it's, I think it's changed from soft to smart. You know, you have, Chris Paul, well, can I say names? I don't know if I can, Mike can say players' names, but I'm not going to say anybody. But you have guys that do the rip through when they're in the penalty. As soon as they're in the penalty, they're ripping through and they're marching to the line. Um, Joel Embiid, the MVP, he shoots, he makes 10 free throws a game. He shoots almost 12. Like, it's because he's physical and because people can't guard him. And, you know, there's tactics and, you know, little gamesmanship to it. Um, as long as you're not doing it the entire game, and I think the refs are getting a little bit smarter on, you know, just flopping and like, like the erroneous plays that should not be a foul. But it, it's always going to be tough because every year the players are getting smarter and smarter on how to get to the line or how to get to their favorite move. Mike, I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Uh, your your old rival Dean Smith Elton used to say the best place to score on the court was the free throw line, I believe. And um, it, it seems more players are aware of that now. Um, and I can say names, uh, players like James Harden and Trey Young are drawing record levels of perimeter fouls. Like there, there are numbers to back it up. Uh, they're very difficult to guard, don't get me wrong, but some people are expressing a little frustration with that, Mike. Uh, do you think any league reforms are needed in this sort of whistle chasing era? I, um, I always thought the underrated guy, this was Corey Maggette. Uh, he, he was just ridiculous in an era when people weren't doing this as much uh, at getting to the line. And that makes me quite good. I don't know. Um, the the uh, the fouls I don't like are the ones where the offensive player generates all the contact. The defensive yeah. players backing up or almost trying to get out of the way in some cases. And the offensive player just generate. You know, it's not a direct move to the hoop. You sort of go off to the side somehow. And that gets called a foul. I would I would legislate that away if the defensive player is not trying to get to the same spot as the offensive players, and the offensive player just goes into a defensive player. Um, and you know the, the way the rules are written probably shouldn't be a foul, but the way they're interpreted, it is. And we all agree that those are fouls. But I just I don't like that aspect of the game. But I don't think that's most of what some of the guys. Uh, that we're hinting at or you're referring to here are doing, I think they are actually really good at getting other people to hit them. And it's yeah. really impressive. Um, and I, I don't know how you legislate that away. No, I think that's correct. I, I think these guys are, A, very, very difficult to guard, very talented and very savvy. Uh, and they know where the money is on that free throw line. And they're not afraid to go get it um, in big situations. Uh, and I think it's not new. I, I would say Manu Ginobili, one of my favorite players of all time, uh, was chasing whistles on both ends of the court. And, you know, these are champions. These are championship plays. They're competitors. Uh, we have a couple more audience questions I want to get to. So forgive me. We're going to jump around here. Fact or fiction? Uh, let's go to Elton here. Uh, the NBA should eliminate conferences in the playoffs. And for instance, just seed one to 16. 
Uh, no Eastern or Western Conference playoffs, just the NBA playoffs. What do you think, Elton? Fact or fiction? Um, to me, it's fiction. And, and I understand, you know, for those fans that came in ninth years back and, you know, they were half a game out of a playoff spot and, you know, lost because of a tiebreaker. But, you know, to me, I enjoy the rivals, the rivalries. You know, like, I, you know, we, we got our butt kicked by Boston. I'm making fun of Mike for the, for the game the other day, but it's like that rivalry, that intensity, like we, we want that in the playoffs. We want to see those, those teams over and over again. Um, and then also travel, you know, they talked about like a, a Portland Miami series in the first round, you're adding a lot of time for travel um, that may be, you know, unnecessary because we know how important sleep is for recovery and for these athletes. So, you know, because of sleep and because of the robberies, like I, I wouldn't do that, but I like to play it. I like to play in one game um, or two games, get it in, see if you can qualify. That's more excitement for your fan base. Um, may not lose, you know, your, your equity in the draft. So I, I like that, but I, I wouldn't be for one through 16. We looked at this a couple of years ago and uh, making the first round of the playoffs or making the playoffs one through 16 um, would add 25,000 miles of travel to the NBA teams travel, which is the circumference of the earth uh, travel. Um, uh, to the NBA team's travel during the playoffs. So that's a lot. And, and the rivalry games would happen about one-fourth or one-fifth as often as they do now. They, they, you know, Jordan talks about getting past, you know, the Pistons talked about getting past the Celtics. Jordan talks about getting past the Pistons. Those things matter a lot to a lot of fans um, back then and now. And um, uh, I think, you know, the Heat talked about getting past us at one point. Um, th those things matter and, and eliminating that just isn't as fun to me. Um, someone will say that we're both in the East, so maybe Sonia has something to say about this. Um, but I, I, I just think the travel point just overwhelms everything else. Yeah, I think so. I think that's fair. And I got, I think we got time for one super spicy one from the audience. Be careful what you say here, Elton. I know this is your first Sloan, so here we go. Uh, Fact or fiction, the NBA needs to change the league's tampering rules with free agency. Elton, well, we're not going to you first. Let's go to Mike. He's an experienced oh. guy. Mike, are are, seriously, you know, you can do this without stepping on anything, but are, are there tampering rules around the league that, that you see? You're, you're a rules-changing guy. Do you think there's, there's some easy fixes or some manipulations to the current rules that could help us here? There's this constant debate between having rules that you think make things better and rules that are difficult to enforce. And that's the difficulty here. We actually were supposed to have increased enforcement um, with the free agency period that just passed, but COVID just totally screwed up this whole past year. Um, and so we actually don't know what an increased enforcement free agency period really looks like yet. Um, so I don't know because I don't actually think we've really felt the you know those rules yet um in terms of in terms of how um the league will approach a free agency period both in terms of inside teams how teams are approaching it and how the enforcement mechanisms approach it this year's free agency was totally screwed. we had to do a whole three months worth of off season in like a week and a half everyone was a mess by the end of it i don't even remember what happened but um it just I don't, I don't think we know the answer to this question because we just changed the rules and have not really had a normal period operating under them yet. Okay. Sorry, that sounds like a bit of a dodge, but I think it's, it's a total dodge, but I appreciate it. <laughs> you know, hey, uh, but seriously, I think there has been some fair criticism. You brought up a great point, Mike, uh, that, you know, it's hard to enforce these things. It's, it's easy to, to outline what should and shouldn't be done, but in an era where players are really friendly with one another, and the league seems to have a real family atmosphere. Everybody talks to everybody. Um, Elton, you know, you've seen this from two or three different sides now. Um, I, I wanted to ask you two things. One, do you think the current tampering rules are even enforceable? And number two, when a team gets caught, do you think the, the damages are severe enough that they're punitive enough? Um, some people have looked at some of the penalties and, and rolled their eyes. Like, uh, why wouldn't I tamper? This is, this is all that's going to happen to me. Um, you know, both good questions. Since I only follow the rules, um, you know, it doesn't pertain to me. But, uh, you know, all jokes aside, it, it, was, it was a time where signings were being announced and I had an executive saying, what's going on? Like, I didn't even get a chance to talk to any of these players. 
So I, I understand it from that level. You want a level playing field, but they are going to be hard to enforce. Um, I'm not sure which rules and penalties you're talking about, but you know, I saw a million dollars, $5 million. Like there was some big fines for certain things um, that, you know, our managing partners, um, they're doing very well, but they would not be happy about. I don't think any team would be happy about, you know, because you went over the line, you have to pay X amount of dollars. So. Okay. I got to sneak this last one in. Uh, it's from our student uh, moderator here, Riley. Fact or fiction, Daryl Morey could beat Elton Brand at horse. Now, Mike Zarin uniquely qualified to, to answer this because you've had a couple of battles with Daryl Morey in horse yourself. But I've never played horse with Elton. <laughs> yeah. But you've seen Elton play a few I, battles. I can answer that one. I can answer that one. He has one trick shot from out of bounds that he goes over the backboard. <laughs> That's true. And, and it's light. Like, he can't, he can't touch me. That's the... Thanks for asking. I know, you know, Daryl's, you know, does a lot for, for the conference, but not even close. I'll tear him up. That's my go-to horse shot too. Coach Raman, thanks for joining us. Do you have a go-to horse shot before we get out of here? Oh God. Um, I, sometimes I try to bounce it off the dead spot on the floor and see if I can get it up there. If no one else knows what the dead spot is, that's, that's my best bet. It's <laughs> a good one. Uh, thank you guys. Um, we have had a great fact or fiction panel. Um, Coach Rahman, Mike Zarin, Elton Brand, thank you so much for joining us. Good luck for, for each of you. Um, and, you know, we, we have big games coming up for, for two or three of you, you tonight. Uh, so good luck in those games. We're eager to see how uh, your seasons finish up. All of you are in contention and all of your teams are really fun to watch. So. Thanks again. We, we have to stay on for a few more seconds until Anita clears us. So any final thoughts? No? Thanks for having us. Thank you, Stu. Yeah, I really appreciate it in this difficult year. Appreciate it. We miss all of you. Hope to see you in person next year. You know, that's a really great way to end it, Mike. I think uh, this Sloan Conference has been very special to me. I know it has been to you and, and to, 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 to